You burn the whole system down, we end up like Venezuela or the former Soviet Union with emaciated teens hunting cats in the streets to eat, right? That's literally what happens in some of these places. All over the world, yeah. That can only be enforced through violence. 100, 100 million dead. And, yeah, yeah. yeah well, no. Let's keep trying. Hello. I recently came across a clip of Joe Rogan having a conversation with Naval Ravikant. Now, in this clip, they're discussing socialism, and I want to talk about it today because I think it's a really interesting case study in capitalist propaganda. And the arguments that they make here are arguments that you're probably going to hear a million times. I've lightly edited the video for time, but I'll link it in the description so you can go make sure I'm not misrepresenting anything. What do you say to the people to. that don't believe that there is such a thing of ethical as ethical or compassionate capitalism? There are absolutely problems with capitalism. I think monopolies are a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, crony capitalism is a problem with the government, you know, kind of gets in bed with them and sort of forces things. Uh, I think the bankers have really, you know, raped society and the rest of us are suffering for Literally. it. So Naval acknowledges problems with capitalism, which to his credit is more than most conservatives are able to do. But I don't think this is the get out of jail free card that he thinks it is. All these things that he mentions as symptoms of crony capitalism, monopoly, lobbying, too big to fail financial systems are consequences of capitalism unleashed on a large enough timeline. A capitalist system involves competition between privately owned firms. That competition will have winners. And over time, if left unchecked, these firms are just going to start out competing or straight up buying out uh, other companies. They're going to start buying off politicians and lobbying the government to get favorable policy. They might even get so big that the economy would literally collapse if they went under which forces the government to prop them up. All of these things are completely predictable outcomes of a capitalist economy. I would argue there's no distinction between crony capitalism and this ethereal real capitalism that Naval is advocating for. So capitalism has gotten a really bad name. Let's talk about it as free exchange, free markets. Free markets and free exchange are intrinsic to humans. Markets are not capitalism. Markets have been around since before capitalism and will likely exist in some form or another under socialism. Free markets and free exchange are intrinsic to humans. From when the first person started a fire and somebody came along with a deer and said, hey, if I cook my deer on your fire, I'll share some of it with you. <laughs> I know it's just an example, but uh, I find it interesting that the explanation for why capitalism is natural is a scenario where one guy is just chilling by himself and then another guy is also on his own and they just chance upon each other and engage in a market transaction. If you know anything about how hunter-gatherers lived, this idea is ridiculous to you. The truth is, for most of human history, people lived in close-knit groups and labored collectively. It's really funny to me that he brings up our hunter-gatherer past to prove why capitalism is natural, considering the fact that the way scholars describe that mode of production is primitive communism. I mean, the whole capitalism is human nature argument is easily defeated by the fact that humans have not always lived under capitalism. Like, <laughs> if capitalism is human nature, somebody better tell that to everyone who lived under feudalism. Those cavemen were really wild for hunting with no profit incentive. That's built into the human species. Basic math comes from accounting. Yeah, that's part of the story. But ancient Mesopotamian civilizations also used math for taxation, astronomy, and calendar creation. This is going to sound really nitpicky to like bring that up, but the reason I'm talking about it is that Naval is trying to paint a picture here that capitalism is intrinsic to humanity, when all he's really saying is one aspect of ancient mathematics was related to market transactions. And when you put it that way, it kind of loses its punch, doesn't it? You want to be a real socialist? Great. Open all your doors and windows tomorrow. Please, yeah. everybody, come take what you want. <laughs> See how that works out. Now, if it wasn't already apparent, this is a clear sign that Naval doesn't really understand what socialism is. There's a difference between private and personal property. Socialism doesn't mean that anyone can just walk into your house and use your toothbrush. It means the toothbrush factory is collectively owned and run democratically. Now, I cut this in from later in the video, but I'm including it here because I think these last three clips we just watched demonstrate that when people talk about capitalism, they tend to take credit for stuff that really has nothing to do with capitalism. Markets, personal property, math. The hunter-gatherers weren't capitalist, and neither were the Mesopotamians. 
So how can you possibly give capitalism credit for these concepts? The correct criticism of capitalism is when it does not provide equal opportunity. And so we should always strive to provide equal opportunity. But people confuse that with equal outcome. Okay, so this is an interesting argument. And it's nice that Naval wants to give everyone equal opportunities. But unfortunately, that's just not possible under capitalism. It's a simple fact that people born with more wealth have more opportunities. Obviously. The green paper that determines what goods you get to access, what you get to do, and where you get to go. Yeah, they have more of that. And as far as equal outcomes, that sort of seems like a straw man to me. I don't know if Naval meant to do that or if he's just unfamiliar with what socialists want. But I don't think any socialist wants outcomes to be perfectly equal. Now, this becomes more apparent as the video goes on, but it seems like what Naval is really opposed to is the idea that any outcomes be tampered with. Because under real capitalism, everyone would have perfectly equal opportunities to succeed. And so if you don't, you must be lazy. But I'm sorry, somebody being homeless is not an outcome that I'm willing to accept no matter how level the playing field may be. Free people make different choices. And when they make different choices, they have different outcomes. And if you don't let them suffer the consequences of bad choices or reap the rewards from good choices, then you are forcibly redistributing through violence. Yeah, sure, this is like a good sentiment, I guess. But we have to consider what those consequences are. Is it really fair to say, hey, choices have consequences when the consequences for the same choice may be vastly different for someone with a few less zeros in their bank account. Rich people are human too. They make mistakes in their lives, but the consequences for those choices are different because the playing field isn't level by design. It's interesting that there, isn't, there, there are no socialist, working socialist examples that exist without violence. You basically mm. need someone to show up with a gun and say, okay, you're not allowed to do that. You hand this over to that person. Yeah, I mean, big deal. You just described what a state is. In capitalist societies, the police and military protect private property and enforce contracts. And of course, in a socialist society, the state would also enforce its policies and laws. So yes, states are backed up by the implicit threat of violence. But I have a feeling Naval doesn't really see it as political when a capitalist country does it. It's just, you know, the way things are. Capitalism. The natural equilibrium of human society. The problem is because of these looters who have ruined capitalism's name, mm. that then you get socialists coming in and saying, burn the whole system down. Right. You burn the whole system down, we end up like Venezuela or the former Soviet Union. You know, you don't want to be a failed socialist state with emaciated teens hunting cats in the streets to eat. Right. That's literally what happens in some of these places. Uh, so I think it's very important not to destroy the engine of progress that brought us here. Yeah, the idea that socialism just hasn't worked yet. That it needs to, the, we just need to do it right. If we do it right, we can, have you right. ever had 100, a debate? hundred million dead and yeah, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> let's uh, keep trying. All over the world, yeah. And, and every single time it's every been implemented. <laughs> when I first heard this, I thought Joe was joking. And like, I know he's not, but it really seems like it because how can you say something like this and not immediately think, hmm, Maybe I'm a victim of propaganda. We could absolutely dig into the facts about former socialist experiments to try and examine what worked, what didn't, and why. Most socialists would be more than happy to have that conversation. But I don't think we even need to do that here. Like, just think about the statement that Joe is making. Socialism has totally failed everywhere, every time it's been tried. Does that statement have a suspicious lack of nuance? Are things in your life ever that simple? I mean, we're talking about many different political experiments tried in multiple countries over many decades. Does it really make sense to you that all of that could fairly be boiled down to it failed? Here we have two guys saying, don't try socialism. It ends up like Venezuela every single time. I mean, eating dogs in the streets, 100 million dead people, yeah, don't even think about it. Do these statements seem like the sort of things that rational adults discussing the benefits and drawbacks of different economic systems would say? I don't think so. The media and education system have really trained people to not think critically about this issue. And if that doesn't do it for you, I have to point out that they are using totally bogus statistics here. 100, 100 million dead and... Yeah, yeah, yeah well... Let's yep. keep trying. 
This 100 million death count comes from the Black Book of Communism, which has been heavily criticized, if not outright disproven, for its shoddy methodology. For example, the book counts Nazi deaths in World War II as victims of communism and pulls millions of deaths seemingly out of thin air in an attempt to reach the 100 million mark. The book is so poorly done, in fact, that multiple authors of it have publicly distanced themselves from the work. And with that in mind, I want you to remember that it's these guys' jobs to talk for a living. Granted, they're not political scientists, but they both have big platforms, and they at least thought themselves well-informed enough to comment on the topic, so I think it's fair enough to hold them accountable for these statements. It really is a testament to capitalist propaganda that they're able to bandy around these platitudes and straight up lies so confidently. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who's a socialist? Who, were, were oh, you... Many times. Some of my better, better friends are socialists. Really? So we, we really get into it. Yeah. And what is there? I mean, does anyone have a compelling p perspective at all? I, I think the, really socialism comes from the heart. Right? You all, we all want to be socialist. Capitalism comes from the head. This is just a platitude, basically. So I don't really know how to respond to it. Other than to say, does this guy not know who Marx is? Whether you agree with it or not, a lot of thinking has gone into the ideology of socialism. I mean, Das Kapital spans three editions and like 2,000 pages. And while I haven't gotten around to reading it yet, I'd be willing to bet it's not about Karl Marx saying everyone should get along and be nice to each other. And speaking of coming from the heart, Naval's little pitch here seems to consist of a lot of platitudes, generalized statements, and emotional appeals. When you're young, if you're, if, if you're not a socialist, you have no heart. When you're older, if you're not a capitalist, you have no head. I understand the capitalist perspective. I don't think they're irrational, at least not all of them. I just think they're wrong. Portraying your opponent as an emotional, irrational actor is a really lazy rhetorical strategy. It allows Naval to sidestep the actual discussion, and it allows people in Naval's audience the ability to feel smug and morally superior over these crazy, emotional, overreactive SJWs who <laughs> just don't understand the world like we do. I always liked Nassim Taleb's framing on this, where he said, with my family, I'm a communist. Mm. With my close friends, I'm a socialist. Uh, you know, at my state level politics, I'm a Democrat. At, you know, higher levels, I'm a, I'm a Republican. And at the federal level, I'm a Libertarian. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Makes total sense. So when you're with your family, you have a stateless, classless, moneyless society. But when you're with your friends, you seize the means of production and control them democratically. And then at your local level, you become a socially progressive capitalist. At your state level, you become a socially conservative capitalist, and at the national level, you become a socially conservative capitalist. See, this statement only makes sense with an incredibly narrow understanding of what socialism and communism actually are. Those words mean sharing, and Naval doesn't want to share with people he doesn't know. Mm. Right. So basically, the larger the group of people you have massed together who have different interests, the less trust there is, the more cheating there is, the better the incentives have to be aligned, the better the system has to work, the more you go towards capitalism. Now, I actually see some merit in the points being brought up here. Aligning incentives such that people are encouraged to work for humanity's collective well-being rather than profit is going to be one of the central challenges for a socialist economy. Now, we can talk about possible solutions for that, but Naval here is just assuming that there isn't one, which is a really lazy and boring take, in my opinion. This idea of income inequality, that always strikes me as a very, it's a deceptive term, income inequality. Well, let's flip it around. It comes from outcome inequality. Well, that's my, my perspective on income inequality. There's always effort inequality. This is just like self-evidently not true. The CEO to average worker pay ratio is about 350 to 1. Are these CEOs really working 350 times harder than the average employee? Obviously, they're not. Now, maybe the CEO had to work really, really hard to get where they're at. But I'm sure I could find you a ton of hardworking poor people too. 
the bottom line is there's not a linear relationship between effort and wealth like Joe is claiming. In fact, poor people literally work more hours, which makes this statement yet another platitude that's being presented as fact. And there's a lot of virtue signaling that goes on now where people say, well, it's because you're privileged. It's yeah, like, well, it's you, know, you know what the greatest privilege is? You're alive. 85% mm -hmm. of humanity is dead. Yeah. So how privileged are you? Then you're living in the first world. Then you're, you, know, you have four limbs, etc. So you can take that argument all the way. It's kind of a nonsense discussion. You still have all your limbs. <laughs> yep. Pack it up, guys. There's no sense in criticizing society or advocating for any sort of change. I mean, it could always be worse, right? Now, I would hate to be arrogant here and declare total victory, but I don't think a single cogent argument was made in this video. And yet, despite that, the tone they use here is still so arrogant and dismissive, which makes this video pretty grating to listen to. But I think this bluster is kind of a facade. The fact is, Naval and Joe still feel the need to defend capitalism. This is not a discussion that would have taken place even 15 years ago. The fact that we're even having this conversation means that we're winning. As class consciousness increases, we will be having this conversation more and more. And I'm sorry, guys, these arguments are not cutting it. Naval does do something nice, though, which is thoroughly seed the moral high ground to socialism. Really, socialism comes from the heart. Mm. With my close friends, I am a socialist. We all want to be socialist. If you're not a socialist, you have no heart. With my aunts, with my brother, with my cousins, with my uncles, with my mom, with yes. my family, I'm a socialist. That's the right way to live a loving, happy, integrated life. So now that we're all in agreement that socialism is morally superior, all that's left for socialists to do is prove that it can work. And that might not be as hard a task as Naval may think. 